I, I literally, an hour and a half ago, uh, was on a walk with a merger and acquisition specialist at a large bank here in Nashville. I'm, I am going to learn everything about banking and shares and equity and, and credit default swaps and how banks make money in the Federal Reserve and interest rates. Like I'm going to learn, I'm going to study that so heavy because it's very scary when you think you're doing it by yourself and you're the only person, you're just a big, stupid moron, big, dumb, dumb donut face. You can't do anything right. Like, all right, I need to get better. So realize that you're not alone. That always helps. And once I've learned that, I start, I stopped putting my poo poo pants on, realizing you can lose as much money as you want, but you can make it back. That's the thing is it's active trading is one thing. Investing is entirely different. And there are some people they're going to fail at active trading. If people are going to blame me for their losses, then they better blame me for their wins also. Right. So, so I want to make sure that they do not do that because they're the ones pulling the trigger. All my job is to do at one point or another is to enrich lives and to educate people on how this works, how the whole mechanisms, the math, the risk, the wealth game, how it actually plays out. Right. And no one criticized me. I mean, I had a few haters on Twitter. They're like, oh, I'm down, whatever, I'm losing money. But I told them, hey, listen, this is what I'm willing to lose. This is my particular risk. This is my risk unit on this particular trade. Here's how much I'm comfortable with. Just make sure that you know your number. And I want to point that out again, because I think that people hear what they want to hear. And yeah. They do. It, I have never, ever heard you post a trade or set up a trade plan ever where you haven't made that very ab abundantly clear that, sure. th you know, this is know your risk, right? That's one of the things that I love about real life trading is how much they focus on teaching people to understand your own risks and play within that, that risk tolerance. So you have yeah. always been transparent with that, but yet mm -hmm. people will continue to hear what they want to hear because for whatever reason, their reasons for doing what they're doing is different than yours. And therefore they're going to look for comments, things, opportunities that are going to support whatever particular ambitious goal that they have at the moment. You know, what's amazing, Tracy, and you're absolutely right. The, the whole kick in the teeth thing. <laughs> it's so awesome because you kind of went back and forth with me and a webinar or two about it because I had a rule for like what? <laughs> Ever. A decade? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't buy banks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have never had a bank stock until like a month and a half ago. And now I don't have much of a bank stock. I have a few bank stocks, but like it was hilarious because Tracy's like, well, I'm pretty sure you had this rule for like a decade, dude. And I was like, yeah, I broke my rule. Yeah. Yeah. And so there you go. Right. It's like, it's the most beautiful recollection of when you do something stupid, you're going to get rewarded. You're going to get reminded. And so now I get to go, okay, what lesson can I learn from that? Am I, cause now I have two things. When people are losing money, figure out one of two things, never do it again, or learn so much about it and become an expert in that thing that you lost money on that you can actually end up making money. Those are the two situations. Right. So for me, guess who's studying banking? Like his life depends on it right now. <laughs> right. Now I'm gonna learn everything about banking. I'm talking, I'm gonna talk to, I, I literally an hour and a half ago uh, was on a walk with a merger and acquisition specialist at a large bank here in Nashville. I'm, I'm gonna learn everything about banking and shares and equity and, and credit default swaps and how banks make money in the Federal Reserve and interest rates. Like I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna study that so heavy because that was my lesson. You get to choose. When I was 20 and I lost all the money for everyone else, I said, do I stop doing that and never do that again? Or do I learn everything I can to make sure that now I know how this works? Right. And it's, it's called plugging the, the boat, the holes in the boat, <laughs> right? Yeah. What are you losing you also, money doing? Stop doing those things or figure it out. Exactly. You just paid 500K for a finance degree, for a master's in finance. That's what you just did. More or less. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And now I can be in the rooms with the, and the truth is now I can be in the rooms with the people who lost billions. Yeah. That'll sound Fair insane, enough. but like my 500 K is nothing. That $2 million investment was literally, I mean, when you sit down and think about how much $30 billion is, I mean, oh my gosh, it was nothing in the grand <laughs> scheme of things. That's what's incredible yeah. about the markets. It's like, I'm yeah. the smallest fish. I don't even show up on the radar. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable the amount and of we're little minnows and we're little minnows, right? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all relative. So going back again to the FRC, feeling okay, you admitted that it felt like a kick in the teeth. 
A hundred percent. My next question now is after doing a bunch of the personal development that you've done, how do you recover emotionally from what you called a failure? I'm just going to call it a loss because I don't think it's a failure because you haven't given up. So I'm just going to call it a loss. How do you recover from a large loss like that? Let's start talk psychology wise first, and then we'll talk about, you know, the, the finance side of it, mm -hmm. rebuilding Perfect. that, that loss. Let's start with the psychology. Um, let's pretend that we are on one of the world's largest stages, the world cup, and you're <laughs> a country, France, and you lose last seconds, penalty kicks, mm -hmm. everyone's watching, everyone expects you to win the loss. And you lost in front of everyone. How do you recover from that? How do you recover from a loss of anything? It doesn't matter if it's the stock market, if it's trade, if it's something magnificently large, the loss of life, right? The mm -hmm. loss of a loved one, loss of family member, a cat, a dog, money, business, number one, you sit down and you ask, why did it happen? Because if you approach it, why did it happen to me? Or why did it happen for me? Those are two different questions. Totally. Right? I had so much pain that happened for me. I had so many gifts that were given to me because I need to put myself on a pedestal now. So apparently I need to learn more about economics and macroeconomics and banking and monetary policy for specific reasons. And so now I, I've been given that gift of I have to be in this world and learn more about it now. I have to study venture capital, Silicon Valley. I have to study VC, uh, private equity firms, so on and so forth, so, to study it and to learn it and to protect other individuals from making this exact mistake. So that's the two things is ask yourself, why did it happen to me or why did it happen for me? You can choose both and come up with some answers. Then once you have the answers to those questions and you've studied it from a psychology perspective, what you get to understand is every single person in massively successful, any, anyone has had crazy, huge losses. So then you realize you're not alone because it's very scary when you think you're doing it by yourself and you're the only person, you're just a big, stupid moron, big, dumb, dumb donut face. You can't do anything right. Like, all right, I need to get better. So realize that you're not alone. That always helps. And then number four, figure out what you're amazing at. What are you amazing at that can create either more income, better opportunities, or um, generally, if you're losing in this situation, it was money. But we go back to the France example, right? What can they tweak? What can they alter? What can they double down on to get even better so it might not happen again or they win another World Cup in the future? Mm -hmm. Because Tom Brady has lost more Super Bowls than most teams have made it to. And he's also won more than any quarterback alive. Mm -hmm. So that says in order to win big, you're going to have to lose big as well. That's just kind of the way the math works because the universe wants to see, do you really care? Are you going to continue? Are you going to keep trying? So double down on what you're amazing at. And this is a psychology piece because now you have to put yourself out there even bigger. Mm -hmm. Random example. Let's say you lose $100,000 on a trade and your account is 300,000. So you lost 30% of your account. You only have $200,000 left. How are you going to rebuild that hundred thousand? Well, from a trading standpoint and an investing standpoint, it's going to take time, like seven times longer generally than whatever, than whatever amount of time it took you to lose it. So if you lost it in two months, in the case of FRC, it's going to take me at least 14 months to get that back. So number one, I know that. Number two, if you're a car salesman and you lost $100,000 in your trading account, figure out how to sell better cars or more cars or faster. Become more efficient at the thing that's, not, that's driving your income. Mm -hmm. because income is in, uh, exponentially scalable. And once I've learned that, I start, I start putting my poo-poo pants on, realizing you can lose as much money as you want, but you can make it back. <laughs> That's the thing is it's, it had to go somewhere. Someone got it. So let me go try to get some of it back from them or just go get it back from someone else who wants to give it to me because it, there's so much of it available. So mm -hmm. that would be number four or number five. I kind of lost track, but put yourself in an abundance mindset where you can make it back. It's not the end of the world. And so many people force themselves into a box where they have to make it back in trading. It's like, why? Why do you want to do that? Why don't you just make it back in general? Who cares yeah. if it's in trading? Because if you figure out how to make it back in trading, great. If you don't, you make it back in whatever, sales, business, 
partnerships, equity, affiliates, mowing lawns, cutting hair, the list goes on. You can do whatever you want to do. Once you know that you can make it back and you can scale it at a high level, do that and just do it both. Do, do it two times, trade and make more money. And then you'll be able to replenish your losses faster. Right. Yeah. Do you feel, because you just said that, uh, why do you have to make it back in trading? And I guess the first thought that comes to my mind is if you don't, do you run the risk of feeling like you're a failure at that particular thing? Or do you think that you need to make it back to kind of prove to yourself that, yes, you can do this? I'm just both curious about the, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, exactly. It's both of those. Um, okay. I think there's a massive difference between trading and investing. And I, I generally tell people there's a five-year time horizon. If you haven't made good, profitable, consistent income in five years, active trading is not for you, but investing is. Right? Don't actively trade. If you haven't made money in five years, listen, I'm sorry to bust your bubble if you're listening on the other side of You're like, well, Newsom, I've done, I've done it for seven years. I haven't made money. I don't know what to tell you. Like, you, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're doing it incorrectly. You, you have two choices, double down on it and go all in or just stop doing it and then invest because you can still invest as a trader. It's a little right. more active. You're, you're not buying and holding Google forever, but you're looking for Google to pull back and you're putting a bunch of money into Google and you're holding it and then it go at 30% and then you sell it and you take your profits and then you reinvest it into Amazon or Shopify or ticker symbol AI or silver. And then you, you make a 20, 30% return and then you repeat that process. So active trading is one thing. Investing is entirely different. And there are some people, they're going to fail at active trading. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I know I own a company that teaches people how to become profitable in both arenas. But if that five-year mark has gone past and you still suck and you're just still losing money, it's not for you, dude. Sorry. Do you, do you stipulate that five-year as five years of serious trading or five years yeah. of, of just dabbling because i know a lot of people that have been you know dabbling serious for, yeah five yeah, years serious yeah. for sure yeah, okay. everyone dabbles that's the right. thing right everyone dabbles the people who get up at 6 a.m study their face off they're doing all the things right they're yeah. tracy can i just use you as the example please <laughs> you can yeah uh, ladies and gentlemen tracy was awesome at the beginning and then sucked <laughs> for like two years she couldn't she couldn't, just like me, she couldn't trade her way out of a paper bag with scissors and a lighting match. <laughs> like she was just nothing you could do. It was all and here. Then there was a breakthrough because <laughs> you put in enough time and you, you study everything to go back to from, you go from the, from the everything to the few, to the one. Mm -hmm. And you find that one thing that clicks, you understand it, you get it, you, you understand and you repeat it over and over and over and over and you, and you make money. Tracy has turned her trading around in such a beautiful and prolific way, focusing on not only volume profile, but candlesticks and just keeping it simple and repeating the same three or four things over and over and over and over and doing the scanning and taking really high quality trades and waiting and being patient with them and knowing what not to do. She did all the things. She traded everything, everything from cryptos to commodities. And then she was like, no, what? I like this. I'm going to trade this. I'm going to trade equities. Got it. Boom. Done. And you did it. What was it? Three and a half years from zero to three and a half years for that switch to turn off. And now you're profitable. Yeah, pretty much. But you know what? That's, it's still a cycle. There's still waves where that of course. it, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. comes in, right? There's, there's moments where just life hits you in the wrong way and you, you find yourself off balance. You know, it's like riding a bike and hitting a stone and falling off of it. And you're just trying to get that wobble back out, but your recovery. Did you dabble Tracy? Right? No, I didn't dabble. I've never dabbled. So I just keep, <laughs> I keep, that's I it. keep learning. Right. And that's, that's the difference. It's, I, it's always a learning experience. Now I wanted to say something about your, your France example, losing the France thing and, and losing. Cause one of the things that I think is really important as well is asking yourself, did you lose or were you beat? And I think that's a difference. There's a difference between the two and, mm. you know, genuinely getting beat because, the opponent was better than you. And that's the difference in a loss. At least when mm. I'm looking at losses is I put this trade out. I know for a fact that I'm not going to win all of them. So did I lose or did I get, did I lose or did I get beat? And if I got beat, it's just because I put the trade on and it, it went against me and that's the way it is. But if I lost, it's because I did something that I shouldn't have done and forced an error 
did something mm-hmm. that I could have grown from. And that's that's the immediate thing that can be rectified right off the bat. And I think mm-hmm. that's really important for individuals to identify is were you beat or did you lose? And um, go from there, right? It's part so of the growth. Good. Yeah, ask good questions. No, it absolutely. I'm just going to go back to your word that you used, Tracy, dabble. Don't, team, don't dabble. Go all in no, on don't. something. Mm-hmm. And whatever, for three years, like go all in. That's, that's a degree. That's a college degree. That's most jobs. I mean, to be an architect, an engineer, a doctor, a hockey player. Like if you're, if anyone here listening is going to pick up tennis and you're going to make enough money to pay your bills as a, for your family, it's going to take more than three years. And you're going to have to freaking play tennis at least 12 hours a week, minimum, minimum to become good enough where you can make that type of money for your family. You said that you run an education company. Obviously, we teach people how to do this, and trading is not going to be for everybody. Universities, do you happen to know what the success rate of universities is? Uh, university degree? Mm. You know it often? Well, when you say success rate, does that mean that they get the degree and they use that degree to make money in that field that they yep. got the degree in? Yep. It, That's it has exactly to be what low. I mean. It it's has very to be, low. It has to be less than 20%. <laughs> I, I, that's my point, I guess. I, I didn't know what the number was. I thought maybe you do because you've got like Mm-mm. every single fact in your head, but I, <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta I, be low. I figured it is. So that's just, again, I don't know why trading seems to be something that stands out from every other industry in the world. And it just gets isolated and treated separately. And it's, it's really not that different. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, mm-hmm. put it in perspective. So that's cool. Now, and the, the, one of the last questions that I have for you right now, anyway, is do you have any other absolute zero plays that you kind of are thinking about at the moment? No, that's a great question. I don't, I don't have any right now. No, no absolute zeros. Everything right now I have normal defined risk with, with protective puts. Um, no, I don't have any absolute zero trades. I, I am looking a lot into the stocks that have fallen a bunch you know, Pinterest probably being one of them, Square and PayPal. Those are three that I'm like, are they really going to go bankrupt? Like, mm-hmm. are, are Chewy is one I'm like, oh, I could. Like, they have big overhead. Are they going to get bought out by Amazon? And, you know, so there's some stocks that fall on a lot, but no, at this point, no, they're absolute zero place. Right. And you know what? I and mean, you just said it there. Like, you start to doubt, like, are they going to recover from this? And I think that this whole bounce that we had in 2020, from COVID. I think a lot of it was an over exaggeration. It's almost like that, that rebound, right? The, when the rebound happens, it always goes further than it really should have been. And then there's this correction that kind of puts things back into perspective. And I think we're still in that over correction stage where we go one way, then we go the other way. And we still haven't balanced out that volatility has come in since COVID that has created this swing in the market. And we're still trying to figure it out. There are some companies that I personally think we're very overvalued uh, and they have dropped back down to earth at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to look at them now with proper perspective because it's, it's like the frog in the boiling water, right? You want to just jump out of it in 2020, we were the frog in the boiling. We started in cool water. We were just boiled and you didn't notice that there was a problem and you just let it keep going. But now it's, you've got that hesitation to kind of jump in, but at the same token, those are the very times that, you know, Buffett's and and you just said it, you know, when when there's panic in the street, those are the times when you got to start thinking about future investments. So what is your go-to to start kind of thinking about what industries might have a future moving forward past COVID? Mm. I start asking people smarter than me who have more money than me and more trading experience than me. That's probably number three. And so it's that's fair for, for everyone to ask me. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna answer you for sure. But that's how I get it. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you the answer. I'm gonna give it to you. But that, that's how I learn. So because, you know, everyone here knows my IQ is maybe 87 on a good day. Yeah. But I, okay. I, I'm going out reaching to people and talking to those who have successfully led billion dollar businesses, helped, helped specifically billions of people, hundreds of millions of people, those are the people that I care the most about to listen to. And so the answer is an industry and a sector that people need to really, really be studying and focusing on is biologics. Essentially, blending your biology 
with machines, machine information, mm. machine uh, technology to live longer. And there, there's obviously very, very volatile industries, but what you want to be looking for is on a smaller private equity side, can you be buying into some of those companies? You know, for anyone out there who has a little bit larger sums of money, can you be buying into those companies at an earlier stage? Then on a stock market perspective, who is buying those companies? Is it Google? Is it Microsoft? Uh, is it ticker symbol AI? Um, who is doing it? And how are they doing it? For example, Nike, believe it or not, is doing a lot in that world because mm -hmm. they're into fitness, obviously. And so they're going to start working on the machines, the robotics, and the wearable tech. Wearable tech is going to be massive. And it's already big with like smart smartphones. But just imagine putting on a shirt that stops you sweating mm -hmm. and can send your information to your phone about your body heat, how many calories you consume that day. Nike's doing a lot of that. And that's a big, big piece is people want to live longer because right now there's more wealth than there's ever been in the world. And you have larger swings of wealth and you have people who, who have tons and tons and tons of money, so much money, so many billionaires and decamillionaires or whatever, a lot of rich people. One of their main concerns is how do I live longer? Hmm. And so the companies that are answering that, uh, Boston Scientific, uh, to, to name one, some of the other companies that are focusing on the biologic space, the wearable tech, the how to live longer, um, how, to, how to create better sustainable environments for the world, for humanity. It's gonna, they're gonna, that's going to be a huge, huge market because mm -hmm. that's what people want. People want to live longer. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Jeremy, I, you're coming back next week. Yes. We have another opportunity to yeah. chat with you. Super excited. Yeah. We just let the cat out of the bag and uh, you know, maybe next week we can talk about biologics. Maybe that's, that's what we focus on next week. Possibly. Do Let's do it. All right, everyone. We've had another wonderful episode and uh, don't forget to leave your comments, that kind of stuff in the back. Dan usually takes care of the end of this, but we love you all. If you have any questions, comments, if you want to be on the show, all that stuff's in the description below. If you want more information about Jeremy, you can check out the links below. And other than that, we will see you next week on the Pivot Podcast. <laughs>